Good afternoon. So hi everyone, I'm Cynthia Minkovitz, Chair of the Department of Population, Family and Reproductive Health, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the 13th Annual Harper Lecture and to introduce our honored guests. Joining us today are four of Paul's family, his daughters Nene Harper and Jeannie Harper Jones, and two of his grandchildren, Allie and Justin. It's wonderful to have you with us here once again to honor uh, your dad and grandfather's memory and his many contributions, not only to our department, but to the field of public health. Before we get started, I'd like to share with you a little bit about Paul Harper and his incredible legacy. And as I was sharing with some of my, or my colleagues earlier, each year as I look through his preventive pediatrics textbook, I learn just a little bit more about him, never being, having been fortunate to have met him in person. So he was a pediatrician as well as one of the founders of the population movement. He completed his MPH here at Hopkins and was appointed chair in the division and the department then of MCH from 1947 to 1970. And personally, I need to comment on how remarkable it is for one individual to have chaired an academic department for more than 20 years. As the biography in your program notes, Dr. Harper was a visionary teacher and leader. What the bio doesn't share, but I think is highly fitting to note given the focus of today's discussion, is that his 1962 textbook, Preventive Pediatrics, Child Health and Development, he includes a section focused specifically on population growth, family planning, and child health. He astutely noted that in many parts of the world, population is, quote, the most important single factor affecting the health of children and their families, quote. I believe he would wholeheartedly endorse two themes of our department, a focus on life course and a focus on population science. Delivering the Harper Lecture this year is the distinguished Dr. John Bongartz, currently Vice President and Distinguished Scholar of the Population Council, where he has been affiliated since 1973. Dr. Bongartz earned an MS in Electrical Engineering with a focus on systems analysis from the Eindhoven Institute of Technology in the Netherlands followed by a PhD in Physiology and Biomedical Engineering from the University of Illinois, and fortunately for us, a postdoc fellowship in population dynamics here at the School of Public Health. His return, which honors our department by delivering this seminar, is in many respects a family reunion for some of our colleagues. Throughout his career, Dr. Brangartz has focused on critical demographic challenges, including some which were described in Paul Harper's seminal textbook. He has published more than 190 manuscripts in leading journals ranging from Science, Scientific American, and Lancet to more traditional population journals such as Demography. His contributions to the field include development of the proximate framework to analyze the level and pattern of fertility, as well as critical thought pieces identifying population options to address population growth. In addition to his service on many scientific panels, he has received numerous honors for his work, including membership in the Royal Dutch Academy of Sciences and the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, as well as career achievement awards from the Population Association of America and the National Institutes of Health. He's reassured me that his uh, accent it does not relate from his time here in Baltimore, but I'll let you decide. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. John Barngartz, who will share his expertise regarding population and family planning in sub-Saharan in Africa. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for that introduction and thank you for this invitation. It's an honor to be here. I, um, uh, it was 60, no, 46 years ago that I first came to this building and met Paul Harper and met uh, Henry Mosley. And I spent uh, one of the best years of my life here as a postdoc. It was a very exciting time. Uh, population and family planning were moving up the global agenda. There were lots of funding available. And I was very lucky that Paul had started the population dynamics department and had funding for me. So I, I spent a year here. Uh, there were lots of students from overseas. I had no responsibilities other than to learn. So I took courses, uh, I uh, read literature, and that provided me with a very important base for the rest of my career. So thank you, uh, Henry and Paul, for all that. So my talk today uh, is about population and family planning. Uh, this is a topic that goes back 50, 60 years ago, and there's still much to be done and much to be said about it, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. So um, let me get this. Actually, I'm going to, I hope you can hear me here, yeah. Uh, I've divided my talk into four parts, 
And um, I'll begin with a quick overview of population trends and projections in Africa uh, using UN data. Uh, uh, next, uh, look at the rationale for family planning programs. What is the theoretical basis why we believe that family planning programs uh, work? Next, look at uh, the evidence we have of an impact of these programs. And finally, um, the reason why we should invest more in family planning programs, there's a very wide-ranging set of benefits that uh, come from reduced fertility. Uh, this graph shows the population of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, from uh, 1950, there were 180 million Sub-Saharan African, uh, one billion, so a six-fold increase. And the UN now expects this to rise to four billion. So three billion more people expected in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and there's no reason to believe that this is of any benefit. In fact, there are many reasons to believe that this will be uh, adverse uh, effects. And here are the reasons for that. Uh, the first thing is that with population growth, you need to make large investments in education, health, infrastructure, just to keep up with uh, population. So imagine everything that is made by man today in Africa, every house, school, clinic, road, anything, has to be rebuilt in the next 25 years again. Then you have to rebuild it again, and then rebuild again. And then you have four times as many of these things, but you also have four times as many people, so you have not gotten ahead. So it's an enormous investment of funding and of um, uh, human resources just to keep up with population growth. It would be much better to slow population growth and use these investments to improve the quality of schools and clinics and infrastructure. Uh, next, uh, there is the obvious environmental degradation. People are pushing uh, the, uh, on the edges of environment. Water quality uh, is uh, getting poor, soil erosion, pollution, and all of that <coughs> contributes to uh, food insecurity. Uh, many African countries today import food, and it will be harder to uh, uh, keep up with population growth in the future. Uh, next, the economic stress of uh, rapid population growth. Uh, rapid population growth means that there are large numbers of young people, uh, and these young people, when they reach age 15 to 20, are looking for jobs. These uh, jobs are not available, and therefore there's a competition for limited positions, reduces wages, contributes to unemployment, and uh, lower and, and poverty. And uh, finally, having large numbers of uh, young, unhappy males uh, is not a good idea because it leads to social and uh, political instability. Now, uh, the next thing I want to point out is that we have this, uh, some people have the idea that poor people uh, uh, or poor societies have all rapid population growth. That's in fact not the case. If you look at uh, a number of, uh, across the world, and here are three poor countries, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and Nigeria, they have very, very different future population trajectories. Uh, Nigeria, um, I've put this on a scale of uh, one, so this is uh, today. Uh, Nigeria is expected to have a four, more than fourfold increase in its population, from about 180 million today to 750 million. Uh, Ethiopia uh, is expected to more or less double, and Bangladesh is supposed to have no more growth. So these are poor places with very different societies, uh, very different projections. And the question is, well, how uh, did this happen? Uh, the first demographic explanation uh, for this is essentially fertility patterns, uh, because mortality trends are roughly similar. So here are the fertility trends for these three countries. In the 1950s and 60s, fertility was very high. Uh, women on average had close to seven children and the three countries were very similar. Then uh, around 1980, Bangladesh uh, fertility took a deep dive, and now it's in a neighborhood of two, or close to two. Um, the next country, Ethiopia, had high fertility all the way till 2000, and then it took a deep dive. And uh, Nigeria, uh, some up and down, but uh, by today, uh, very little change in fertility. 
Um, so next question is why is fertility uh, so different? And the answer is largely the level of contraceptive use in these countries. So um, in the 1960s, um, in all three countries, and in fact in most of the developing world, only a small fraction, two, three, four percent of women were using contraception. Around 1980, contraceptive use shot up in Bangladesh and is now is in the mid to high 60s, not too far from levels that you find in Europe today. Ethiopia, one, two, three, four percent until 2000, and then a jump to uh, today about 35, 40, and the UN expects this to continue in the future. Uh, Nigeria has seen some increases, some ups and downs, and today it stands at about 15 percent. Uh, so the final question is why are these trajectories so different? And I think you can guess. Um, these sudden breaks in the history of uh, these trend uh, occurred at the time of a family planning program initiation. And I'll come back to that later. But uh, Bangladesh started its fa national family planning programs in the late 70s, around 80. Um, the uh, Ethiopia had no big uh, family planning program until the early 2000s. And Nigeria still doesn't have a family planning program. So the main story uh, I'm going to tell you uh, is that family planning programs can change trajectories of contraceptive use, which reduces fertility, which reduces population growth. Um, now, if it were that easy, um, I, this would be widely accepted. But um, there are critics out there who don't believe the story. So I have to give you some more background and a theoretical basis for believing why this is, in fact, uh, the, uh, the right story. So uh, a word now about the rationale for family planning program. And basically, it boils down to this. If we, uh, we now have... Uh, estimates of desired family size for literally 100 plus countries for most of the developing world. And if we average uh, these estimates, then Sub-Saharan Africa has, uh, on average, women want uh, close to five uh, births. In Asia, it's uh, roughly two and a half to three, and Latin America is slightly lower. Uh, this makes perfectly good sense. Uh, very, in historical societies, uh, families wanted large numbers of children. Today, uh, with modernization, uh, desired family size has declined. Now, to an economist, this is no problem. Um, you want two children, you get two children, just like you get a uh, bicycle and uh, two uh, uh, cars. You uh, uh, treat children as durable good, and you find uh, what you can afford. But this picture uh, misses a part, an important part of the story, and that is made clear here. Um, in order to get uh, to two children, women have to avoid having the four children that they would have had without contraception. So in the absence of contraception, women would have an average seven children. To get from seven to two and a half or three, you have to avert all these births. Think about a woman who has a birth at age uh, 20, a second birth at age 23, and a third birth at age uh, 26, then she has to avoid getting pregnant every menstrual cycle between age 26 and age 45. That's hundreds of times that she's at risk of getting pregnant. Even if you use contraceptive uh, effectiveness of 98%, you still have a better than 50-50 chance of having an unplanned child. So this is the key uh, reason why family planning programs work. And uh, the first I should uh, tell you that these women, uh, the women who don't want to get pregnant anymore, are considered to have a demand for contraception. That's the standard language we use. So here is uh, the average estimate for Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and Latin America of the proportion of women who don't want to get pregnant, and they're supposed to have a demand for contraception. So in Africa, about half the women don't want to get pregnant. Asia, it's about 70, and in Latin America, about 75. Now, in the, real, in the perfect world, all these women would be using contraception. But in reality, that's not what happens, and uh, only a proportion of them. The blue part of the curve shows you the proportion that is actually practicing family planning. And then there is a residual 
uh, women who don't want to get pregnant are not practicing family planning. And that is referred to as an unmet need for contraception. Uh, the unmet need for contraception is about 15, 20% in Latin America and Asia, and much larger in Sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, roughly half of women who don't want to get pregnant are not using contraception in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, uh, what happens if you um, have women who don't want to get pregnant and not using contraception? You end up with unplanned births. And here are uh, estimates of the numbers involved. So let's start with the uh, all pregnancies. In annually, and this is estimate for 2014, there are 190 million pregnancies in the developing world. Uh, out of this 190, 125 end in live birth, 36 million end in induced abortions, and there's a smaller number that ends in miscarriages, which I'm not taking into account here. So this is the total. But as I said, a good number are unintended. In fact, out of all pregnancies, under 190 million, 39% of all pregnancies is unintended. Women get pregnant when they don't want to be. That results in 74 million unintended pregnancies. Uh, about half of those, uh, no, and then birth, you have 125 million births. 20 million are unplanned births, or 22% of births are unplanned. And then the 36 million uh, abortions, of course, are all the result of unplanned pregnancies. So clearly, um, this is, uh, these events can be averted by providing more effective access to contraception. Um, so why are women who don't want to get pregnant not using contraception? Um, here are the reasons that uh, surveys suggest are most important. Uh, first, some women have a lack of knowledge uh, or even availability. Uh, this is, uh, most women in Asia and Latin America now have uh, knowledge and access, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, that is still uh, a problem, particularly in rural areas. Uh, the cost of modern contraception, the pill, injectable, IUD, is very substantial for poor women, uh, so they, uh, that's an obstacle for them. And uh, that's why we need subsidized uh, uh, contraceptive access. Uh, health concerns, concerns about side effects, are among the most important reasons why women uh, do not use contraception. Uh, then there are objections from husbands and family members uh, who may have a different opinion of how many children the family should have. And then finally, there are concerns about moral and social acceptability of contraception. In traditional societies, contraception is, is not something you easily talk about. It, it's uh, seen as a, uh, uh, a not uh, socially acceptable uh, topic. So uh, bringing in the idea of contraception uh, is uh, difficult. Um, and what family planning programs do then is to provide access to contraception. Um, they remove social, economic, cultural, health, and uh, obstacles to contraceptive use, in particular economic, uh, reducing the cost. And thirdly, and this is important, uh, they inform couples about the benefits of long birth intervals and smaller families. So it's, it's not just working on the supply, giving women access to contraception. You also have programs, radio, uh, television, and media programs that talk to women and uh, explain why uh, smaller families are important. And that helps bring down uh, desired family size. So now look at, uh, uh, so that's the theoretical story. Uh, now let's take a look at uh, the impact, the, the empirical evidence we have to show that uh, these programs actually work. And there are two parts to the story. I begin in Bangladesh and Pakistan because that's the most interesting historical story. And then come back to Sub-Saharan Africa where uh, the major uh, influence of programs now is still pending. Um, uh, the, this is a famous experimental result uh, from Bangladesh. Um, in the, if you think back uh, to the mid-70s, uh, Bangladesh was called the basket case of the world by Henry Kissinger. It was the poorest, most illiterate country in the world. And nobody really believed that family planning could work in such a traditional society. 
Uh, the government wanted to do it anyway, and one of the things they uh, helped with is to uh, do an experiment. They picked a district, rural district called Matlab, and uh, they cut in half. Half of the district, about 100,000 people, was given no additional service, basically the same services as the rest of uh, the country. And the other half was given the best family planning services that we could think about. Um, all methods, uh, home delivery, et cetera. And the results were astounding, at least uh, certainly at that time, um, from roughly 5% contraceptive use in, uh, by, before the experiment. In a year time, contraceptive use uh, rose to 30%. And that continued in the future. The control area eventually also rose, but the difference between the intervention and the control area was maintained. So this demonstrated without any doubt that a family planning program can have a large impact on a behavior. And uh, this then induced the government to take the lessons from MATLAB and implement them nationwide. And here's what happened. So this is um, uh, Bangladesh contraceptive use in the early 80s, it rose very rapidly, uh, and it's now in the mid-60s. Uh, now, this is an unusually rapid pattern, and uh, I'm comparing it here with Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan did uh, very little, or very limited. Uh, uh, they have a family planning program, but it is not nearly as well organized or high quality. So Pakistan did have an increase, but it is uh, relatively uh, uh, weaker and therefore you have a large difference between Bangladesh and Pakistan in uh, contraceptive use. Now, this differential uh, between these two countries in prevalence led to a differential in fertility, higher fertility in Pakistan than in Bangladesh, and it led to difference in future population. So take a look at this. This is really amazing how big this impact was. So in, uh, in 1980, Pakistan and Bangladesh had almost exactly the same number of people. Uh, the Bangladesh uh, implemented the family planning program, fertility fell and population growth started slowing. And the UN expects it to be roughly the same size as today, which is uh, 160 million or so. Pakistan uh, uh, did very little and too late and the projection of the UN expects now about 360 million. So this gap, is to a large extent due to the family planning program, I think. Now, um, and this is, uh, this, the message here is that a small change in fertility has a lot of impact in the long run on population growth. Now, uh, when I show these slides to some of my colleagues uh, who are critics, they say, oh, this is not a family planning program. You're forgetting about education. Education is important. Well, how, do we, how can we tell? So, uh, uh, so uh, this, this is a battle I've had with a few colleagues, including people on the World Bank. Uh, they don't believe in family planning, they believe in education as the driver of uh, population trends. So um, let me show you what I uh, say in response. So first the question is, are Bangladesh and Pakistan indeed different in the level of education? And I calculate here the mean years of schooling of women aged 20 to 39. So in 1970, on average, uh, both in Bangladesh and Pakistan, women on average had one year of schooling, which is almost nothing. And over time, indeed, Bangladesh uh, is uh, half a year or so ahead. Uh, and that gap uh, widens over time. But if we look back at the 1980s, it was less than a year. So yes, there is a difference in education. And how can we decide uh, whether that difference is the cause of the difference in prevalence? So that lead me to this slide, which I hope answered that question. Uh, along this axis, I have the mean years of schooling. Uh, this axis is percent using contraception. And uh, the blue line is Bangladesh going from 1970 to 2000 to 2015. And Pakistan is um, 1970 to 2015. So what we can do here is controlling for years of schooling. Uh, we can see what the level of prevalence is in Pakistan and Bangladesh. And say, let's take three years 
Uh, with three years of schooling, which happened in the early 2000s in Pakistan, prevalence was about 30%, but it was 50% uh, in uh, <coughs> Bangladesh. So this is controlling for education level. So clearly there's something else going on. If, uh, there was an, if education were the only factor um, in determining contraceptive use, then the red and the blue line would lie on top of one another. So the difference is due to the difference in the family planning program. Now, as I said, uh, Pakistan uh, also has a program, but it's weaker. So in the absence of a program, it would have even lower contraceptive use somewhere along this line. So to sum up, uh, the effect of education is given by this line. With rising education, you expect an increase in prevalence. If you add the Pakistan program, you get this much prevalence. If you add the Bangladesh program, you get this much level. So uh, I think this is an argument for saying, yes, uh, uh, education matters a little bit. It's mostly family planning. Now let's look at Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, first a quick look at uh, overall trends. So these are trends in contraceptive use uh, for the 30 largest countries in Africa. And um, you can see the green lines are countries that already had been advanced in the transition in 1990s, Kenya, Zimbabwe, and Sub -Saharan Africa, uh, South Africa. And they had started programs in the 70s and 80s. And they stayed uh, at the top uh, until 2015, uh, the three uh, highest scoring countries. Then if you look uh, again at 1990, uh, other than those three countries, the large majority of countries had essentially nothing going on. The average is about five, and uh, most countries had less than 5% use, which is essentially negligible. Then this group of countries uh, split apparently into the yellow uh, lines. These are the breakthrough countries where things happen very rapidly. So uh, Malawi went from 5% to over 50%. Rwanda went from 5% to 46%, Zambia too, Madagascar, Ethiopia. Um, so uh, these are countries that in a very short time have managed to raise contraceptive prevalence. And uh, the most uh, rapid increasing period is in uh, Rwanda. Rwanda was relatively flat, then it had uh, the ethnic turbulence in the uh, late in the 90s and in the early 2000s, the government massively invested in family planning and contraceptive use shot up. Uh, so these are the good news countries. Then we have the rest uh, of majority of populations in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa where relatively little has happened. There's minus, minor increases, uh, but these are all countries that still have a long way to go. Now, so this is simply uh, time uh, uh, trends in prevalence. To the next slide uh, is a little complicated, so let me spend a minute uh, explaining what I'm doing here. This is the idea, uh, the idea is here to control for uh, schooling, or I, I use schooling as an indicator of the level of development. So uh, here is number of schooling years, and here is contraceptive use. So let's look at the red lines here. Each country has one line. The beginning is over here, and the end is uh, uh, 2015. So let's take this line here. This is Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria, from 1970 to 2015, had a very substantial increase in schooling, and on average, women have about seven uh, years of schooling. This is Congo, and this is Cameroon. Uh, but despite this fairly high level of education, contraceptive use is only 15%. So uh, I, this is group one countries, the countries where very little is going on because they don't have family planning program. Then the second group of countries is Zambia, Uganda, Tanzania, and Ghana. They have roughly the same level of education and development as group one but they have done much better in terms of uh, prevalence. So um, this is Zambia, <coughs> Uganda, etc. So comparing this group with this group is 20% higher prevalence, uh, and that is largely due to the better family planning programs in group two than in group one. Um, 
Uh, group three are the forerunners. Uh, they have had long-term investments in uh, family planning. This is Kenya, South Africa, and Zipa. And they also have pretty good program. But then group four, uh, these are the stars, if you will. Uh, this is Malawi, Rwanda, Madagascar, and Ethiopia. Uh, what stands out here is that they have gotten high levels of contraceptive prevalence at relatively low levels of um, education. So uh, if they had not had these family planning programs, their prevalence would be somewhere down here. So these programs have moved the country from over here to over here. And then the last group, five, the reason why I mentioned these is they don't stick out very well. Uh, these are the white lines. This is Mozambique, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. What is interesting about them is that they have very, very, they're among the lowest uh, levels of education, about one, uh, one and a half years on average. Yet they have modern contraceptive use levels of 15 to 20%. And that is very unusual for a country with so little education. So these countries are actually uh, investing in family planning program, but they're up against a a demand situation that is difficult. So even investing in, in poor countries, very traditional countries, the best programs cannot uh, get pro, uh, prevalence up to very high level because the demand side is not uh, quite there. And um, so uh, the bottom line is that we can distinguish countries by the slope of their curves. No family planning, uh, you get an increase in uh, prevalence with level of education. Uh, the better the program, the steeper the slope is. And these are the best programs. So this, I think, is a way to measure the impact of family planning program. Um, so I've talked now about um, the effect of programs on contraceptive use. What we're interested in is also the effect on fertility. And uh, what I've done here is I've taken six pairs of countries. Uh, each pair consists of two countries that are roughly equal in level of development. Let's say Burundi and Rwanda, they're neighbors. And the top country has a weak program and the bottom country has a strong program. So this is, in, uh, this is about 10 years ago, the estimate. And you can see that there's a clear difference between um, this fertility and this fertility. It's about a birth and a half. So the same, roughly the same result uh, holds for Uganda and Kenya. Kenya had a long-standing program. Uganda didn't do very much until a few years ago. A year and a half difference uh, program impact. Pakistan and Bangladesh already talked about fertility difference of about a year and a half. Jordan and Iran. Now, Iran is actually one of the more interesting stories that I think few people are aware of. Uh, during the 80s, uh, the conservative government uh, essentially had no family planning. They were pro-natalist, and fertility was high. Then in 1989, there was a 180 degree turn in the views of the government, and suddenly they massively invested in family planning program. They already had a good healthcare system, so it was relatively easy. And during the uh, 90s, fertility in Iran dropped from uh, about five and a half to two and a half, which is one of the most rapid declines in the 90s in any country in the world. And then finally, we have here the Philippines and Indonesia. Indonesia adopted family planning programs early on. Uh, Philippines has been a weak program, and that's in part due to the uh, role of the Catholic Church uh, that's been opposed to a family planning program. So this is the fertility impact now, the effect on population growth. Um, and uh, this is the same graph I showed at the beginning, the standard projection for Sub-Saharan Africa from 1 billion to about 4 billion. The UN also makes high and low projections. The high variant uh, adds a half a birth on average to the trajectory, uh, and the low variant subtracts half a birth. Uh, the point here is that by just changing fertility by half a birth, you reduce uh, the population size by more than a billion. That's just half a birth. Now, I already mentioned that the impact of a family planning program can be a birth and a half. Okay, so if we go from minus five to say minus one, 
Uh, my best guess is that if you implemented Rwanda's program everywhere in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, you might end up with two rather than with four billion people. And that is, I think, a, a rather large number. OK. I have shown, I think, that family planning programs can change fertility, can change population growth. We still have one piece of the puzzle left. And it's, why would we do that? What are the benefits of reducing fertility? And uh, why we should we make these investments? So I want to quickly run over uh, a wide ranging set of benefits that we now realize come with family planning programs and reduce fertility. Um, there are six items here. Women's empowerment, health, government, economy, environment, and social and political stability. Um, so let me say a word about each one of those. Uh, women's empowerment, with lower fertility and family planning, women have greater freedom to determine the number and spacing of their children. And because they have fewer children, they have time to participate in the formal labor force. This is actually an important part that drives the economies in transition countries. Uh, health. Um, every pregnancy has a risk of death associated with it. So having fewer pregnancies leads to a reduced lifetime mortality for women. It improves infant and child health and fewer abortions. And in much of the uh, developing world, abortions uh, are done under safe conditions, are associated with high levels of uh, health problems. At the government level, uh, you see throughout Africa, uh, governments struggling to, keep up, uh, to build schools, to build clinics, to build infrastructure, to keep up with the very rapid increase in pupils and clients and so on. So uh, if that uh, were reduced, you end up uh, uh, investing in the quality of schooling and healthcare rather than in the quantity. Uh, the economy benefits from what is called the demographic dividend. Uh, the demographic dividend is a temporary boost, a temporary meaning several decades. Uh, it increases the GDP per capita. And the reason why it does that is that by lowering fertility, you reduce the number of young people under age 15 and you get a higher ratio of workers to uh, dependent. In addition, uh, it increases savings, which uh, 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 growing economies badly need. Uh, environmental benefits uh, reduce pressure on natural resources, water, soil, forest, agriculture, and energy, and reduced air, water, and soil pollution. And then <clears throat> a slower growth of the youth population leads to lower unemployment. And as I already said, having a large numbers of young, unhappy males uh, is not a good idea. So my conclusion then from this part is that population of Sub-Saharan Africa is expected to quadruple, uh, adding 3 billion. The family programs have demonstrated effectiveness in reducing fertility and population growth. And when you reduce fertility, there are substantial socioeconomic health environmental, governmental, and political benefits. So um, if you believe that, then of course you would invest massively in family planning program. Uh, but that's not what's happening. So let me say a few words about that, OK? I, I'm very persuaded by this, and I hope you're persuaded by these conclusions. But let me show you what actually happens. Um, this bar. Um, uh, ends up uh, at about 100, 180 billion. It's the total overseas development assistance provided by rich countries to poor countries in 2014. So <clears throat> these dollars of assistance go for a variety of purposes. Uh, the red bar is education, health, HIV, other social, infrastructure, production, multi sector, and other. Uh, I'm not sure what it is, that's probably overhead. So now where's family planning? Well, if you look carefully at the sliver up there, family planning gets about 1% of overseas assistance right now. And this 1% is a substantial increase of what it was 10 years ago, when we were closer to half a percent. So we've made good progress in the past uh, decade or so, but we're still a tiny sliver of the overall overseas development story. 
and I think that's wrong. Um, but <clears throat> so why is that? Why um, does the international community pay so little attention to family planning? And there are a whole list of reasons, and here are uh, some of them. The first is that um, ever since the Cairo conference, there's been an emphasis on health and rights uh, as for, uh, rationale for family planning and a neglect of economic benefits. Um, uh, uh, the way I sometimes see this happening is that uh, if you talk to high level government officials, we, uh, family planning, oh yes, we do that. Uh, it's in the health department over there. It's often in the basement of the health. Uh, what I'm, uh, the health department, the health ministry are uh, uh, among the lowest on the totem pole. Then within the health ministry, family planning is priority number 15 and number 20, because many of these countries have so many other health problems, okay? So you, you are demoting family planning by insisting that it is a in health intervention, which it is, uh, you giving it very low priority, both in the international community and at the governmental level. And the way to solve that problem is to emphasize the economic and environmental benefits, uh, which is what we are beginning to do now by talking about the dividend. Uh, the second problem we have is that many economists, including many or most of the World Bank economists, don't believe family planning programs work. And even if they do work, they say uh, population is a neutral phenomenon. Uh, this is a long story. I could uh, talk an hour about this, but, but uh, these, are, these are the people who, uh, so if a World Bank mission goes to uh, Niger or to Nigeria or Congo, they hardly ever talk about family planning. They have many other things on their agenda. AIDS epidemic. Um, in the 90s, there are many serious uh, epidemiologists who predicted that the population of Africa would basically flatten out or even decline. So they were totally unaware that we could bring the epidemic under control. We now have treatment uh, available. And that change of opinion about the AIDS epidemic had led to massive increases in the projections that the UN has made. So these four billion projection for Africa is fairly recent. Uh, the last two or three revisions. Before that, Africa was supposed to have a much lower population trajectory because of the uh, expected impact of the AIDS epidemic. Um, opposition from conservative groups. Um, uh, we're talking here, uh, we, we know how this works in the US. Uh, we have Congress trying to defund family planning organizations. The same thing, uh, this, this is the conservative right, but also particularly the Catholic Church. Uh, and the Catholic Church is actually important because it has uh, observer status with the UN. So they can get in the middle of uh, treaties. At, at the Cairo conference, the Catholic Church was in every room uh, pushing its own view. And that's uh, why uh, family planning and the issues that we care about are not very high on the agenda. The same reason is why um, the Millennium Development Goals uh, never talked about population or family planning. Uh, the fifth reason is the fear of coercion. Uh, the Chinese one-child experiment has done incredible damage to our field. Because after that, and after the Cairo, many women's health groups and rights groups want nothing to do with family planning because they think we are coercing, we're going to coerce people. Now, of course, no government would get away with coercing women now, but that's what they're afraid of. And then finally, um, there were very large declines in Asia and Latin America during the 70s. By 2000, the uh, fertility in um, Asia and Latin America was down below three. So people say, well, we're done, okay. Asia and Latin America have had their decline. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa will follow shortly. So this problem is taken care of. Uh, so my final recommendation is uh, threefold. Um, we should make family planning program a development priority, not a health priority, a development priority. We should argue that uh, a dollar invested in family planning has multiple benefits for all sectors. I once kiddingly told uh, a minister, say, what we need to do is every ministry in your country should uh, take 1% of its budget and invest it in family planning. 
and everybody would be better off. So if the education department took 1% of the budget and it reduces the number of pupils by 5%, they have better off. Same thing for the health, for uh, et cetera. Uh, the second uh, recommendation is that we have to econo engage economic decision makers and top government officials. We tend to talk to the Minister of Health and the family planning people in charge of things, but they tend often to have not a great deal of influence and certainly they don't have the money. The, we need to convince the Minister of Finance and the head of the Planning Commission and the Prime Minister. We need to get the Prime Minister and the President on TV and the radio saying family planning is important. And in the countries where, uh, like Rwanda and Ethiopia and Malawi, the timing of a president's statement about family planning coincide very closely with the time that uh, contraceptive use goes out. And then finally, uh, we have to strengthen the organizations that are doing great work in our field. Uh, FP2020, which is a consortium of international donors and governments that is uh, moving uh, the field ahead. The Gates Institute uh, doing great work, and there are many other countries that are working on family planning and uh, trying uh, to do the right thing. So thank you very much. Yes. Um, from a, thank you very much. From an ecological perspective, we know that birth in a developed country is much greater CO2 emissions and use of resources than the birth in sub-Saharan Africa. So some scholars are saying now that we need the one-child family norm rather than the two-child family norm in developed countries. Uh, this is especially important in the U.S. where we have about 1.5 million more births than deaths every year due to momentum and also due to uh, immigration. So have you... Would you comment on that? Is, uh, is, are we right for a one-child family norm, or is it... Uh... Uh, yeah. if, uh, anybody who says we're going to go to a one-child policy is going to get in real trouble. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, it's, this is socially and politically uh, uh, absolutely no way. In fact, as you well know, the countries like Japan and uh, Germany and Russia, where fertility is 1.5, 1, 1. Uh, the government is actively trying to increase fertility. They're giving birth bonuses, they're giving family benefits, they're giving all sorts of, they're trying to get fertility up. So, uh, that, so my own view is that uh, that's not going to work politically or socially. You have to get people to behave uh, differently. They should drive uh, lower gas mileage cars and do all the things uh, like buy Prius, uh, for example. Um, yeah, we can uh, change our footprint. In, uh, and to be honest with you, if you look at the projections for Japan and uh, Russia for the future, okay, the age pyramids, they used to be this, they're going to be like this, okay? You're going to have one retiree for every worker. And if you have pay-as-you-go pension system, that, you just can't do that. So increasing population growth in the U.S. is not a problem? No, I think it is a problem, but uh, it cannot be solved by uh, saying everybody should have only one child. I, I definitely think that Americans are over-consuming and contributing. We are the biggest polluters uh, in every dimension. But uh, saying you can have only one child is not going to work. Not to say it, but uh, they the, the, norm, the idea of the norm, the two-child family norm, they were the ZPG movement in the 60s. Well, it, these things are already happening. Uh, the TFR in uh, the U.S. is now 1.8 or so. Uh, so uh, we're below, we're slightly below replacement, and uh, yeah, <clears throat> kind of a, a different um, uh, take on on uh, the point that Stan was making. Uh, this uh, gap between the developed country and and developing country in terms of rate of population growth mm -hmm. and the pressure of of that's generating of people in the south wanting getting to the north mm -hmm. uh, has, I think, contributed to the rise of nationalism mm -hmm. uh, in this country and other countries. And uh, some people saw it as a safety valve to, mm -hmm. to sort of moderate the population pressure. But that safety valve seems to be closing. Mm -hmm. In terms of sort of the geopolitical um, and your last point about 
within the country, developing countries, I think it also has an impact in the developing yes, co developed countries. Yeah. So I wonder if you could comment on that. Uh, I think your point is very well taken. And uh, the North is getting worried about too many people in the South. Now, actually, the number of migrants compared to the natural growth of population is, is small potatoes. So uh, the uh, effect of migration on the South itself is relatively small, except for remittances that come back. And they are very often very important. But taking a look at it from the North um, in Europe, and they have countries now where 15, 20% of the population is foreign born. And that leads to a reaction um, from the population. So we, we're seeing a movement to the right um, in many countries, particularly in Eastern Europe. And uh, the governments in Europe have much more control over their uh, uh, labor market. It's much harder in Europe to immigrate and find a job and, and, uh, than in the US. So I think in Europe, if the countries want to. to change that. Well. <laughs> one, yeah. one guy is trying to change Yeah. Um, so. Uh, to my mind, uh, if you look at it from the German or the Hungarian point of view, uh, having migrants uh, is not good, according to the... I'm thinking of it broader. I think this is a benefit for the people who migrate. Uh, that's why they're coming, and uh, whatever income they have can help people back home. So I'm in favor of more. I'm an immigrant myself, so uh, I'm in favor of immigration. But I can understand why too much of this is upsetting people. So I've, oh, go ahead. Oh. Um, so, yeah. Back here, oh, great, go ahead. Thank you. Asa from Burkina Faso. Um, I, I think that we in the healthcare field already struggle with the way to communicate evidence-based to the public, especially in the context and cultural population with limit literacy. So uh, I also agree with the fact that we, sh like when on your slide, we talk, you talk about um, getting government official um, say on the TV about talking on the TV about family planning. But I was skeptical of how much or how far should we allow them to talk to people in those settings like in low and middle income country where the corruption and the population have limit, limit trust to the government already, of them to not think of a political thing. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the, the question. Did you? Somebody? Um, my question is how, how far and how much you think we should allow the political um, representative to talk to the population and get involved into family planning um, in the fear of the population belief of, uh, popu of political cohesion or something. How, how much the government should be talking to the population at large? Okay, as far as yeah, the good question, yeah. So you, in a way you're saying that if the, uh, the high level politicians talk about family planning, then they're in a way coercing families doing different what they otherwise would do. I see it slightly differently. I think that uh, family, uh, in traditional societies, you basically do what uh, everybody has done for a very long time. And uh, it's difficult to change behavior. The, the first person to use contraception in a village uh, will be frowned upon, okay? And uh, to bring information to these couples and to these villages that smaller family size and spacing is a good idea is a new information that they can act on or cannot act on, but it, it's uh, valuable information that they need to make the right decisions for themselves. So I don't have any problem with the government saying family, small families are good for these and these reasons. Now, I'm totally against coercion, but I think providing information that is useful to couples, I think, is fine. So, Tao, did you have a question? Well, no, my question, no, I can ask it at lunch if I, if I don't get to ask, ask it. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, the, the question is about uh, uh, what is uh, happening right now with HIV infected women in, in Africa. And uh -huh. you correctly mentioned that uh, uh, antiretroviral treatment is, uh, is having great impact, uh, mm -hmm. and that is very encouraging. Yeah. One thing we are seeing uh, which seems to be a recent phenomenon, is that there are so many subsequent pregnancies. Uh, so these women are healthy, 
Yeah. They, yeah. And their expectations are different now, having more children. Yeah. But it is not due to not using family planning. Mm -hmm. It is based on the demand that their new partners are mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, asking, or I specifically refer to Malawi, actually, one of the stars. So. Mm -hmm. I, I did witness in Malawi when uh, it was illegal to say family planning, and now seeing now 50% yeah, yeah. uh, 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 contraceptive exactly. prevalence is... Uh, so, and, and this is not uh, related only to Malawi, actually. Uh, we have seen it also in Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Uganda. So there are so many subsequent pregnancies mm -hmm. for these women who are now on treatment, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, it's still... Uh, I, I don't know if this, this will have great impact, but uh, it is something that is probably more uh, more recent. Mm, well, I I think it's uh, I have no problems at all. I think if women who are HIV positive and are on treatment and want children, I, I don't have a problem with that. It would be hard to stop that, and uh, these women might be afraid about their future. They want somebody to care for them when they're older or sick. They, there may be good reasons why they would want to have children. Um, but uh, I, I don't see why the government would want to ch change that. Uh, there, it is it is a dynamics of uh, of the uh, of the family planning. So right. it is not uh, due to say failure or not availability of family planning. Right. But this woman just their their what they see or what they desire at this point. It is right. not only their own will. Right. Uh, it is the partners that are. Uh, yeah, and there, well, there is heavy... The partners are very important in uh, Africa in every society. So what the woman wants doesn't necessarily fly. And in, in many countries, it's the man who decides how many children, whether they use contraception and so on. So it, it, it's, uh, the partner is very important. You're right. Uh, there's somebody here. I'll ask my question and then pass it on to Oying, sorry. Um, so thanks for your, your well-structured argument. I thought you kind of carried us through the story really well, so I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to understand the kind of comparison between Bangladesh and Pakistan better. During that time period, what was the difference in international funding that was going into the countries for development programs? Well, um, the Bangladesh money, uh, the Bangladesh government, actually, Henry, you were there. Or, uh, <laughs> So AID and other governments were providing massive assistance. Uh, but the, the difference between Bangladesh and Pakistan was primarily, I think, in the attitude of the government. The Bangladesh government very much wanted to uh, invest in family planning, and they realized they had a very densely populated country, very poor, famine was frequent. They knew that uh, if the population doubled or tripled, they would be in trouble. Pakistan is, is a bigger country, uh, it's not necessarily better off, but uh, they, uh, they were resistant to um, uh, family planning. So even uh, government certainly would have funded uh, family planning in Pakistan in the 70s if the government had been open to that. Uh, later on in the 80s and 90s, I think the Pakistan program did uh, begin to operate, uh, but not quite the same way as Bangladesh. And in, in fact, in many countries in the developing world, foreign aid has been very important. Uh, right. yeah, okay. So just uh, two points to elaborate or support uh, one of your major points. And I, I don't know if you recall this, uh, John. When we were doing the learning agenda for demographic dividend for Bill and Melinda Gates, mm -hmm the two top economists on demographic dividends said that the impact of family planning on fertility is very small. It's only 0.5. Yeah, here you go. Yeah. Right? And you were arguing that it's at least one, most likely 1.5, and maybe two. Yep. You should remember that, yep. right? And then Bill Gates said, 0.5? You said that's small? <laughs> that is huge! Uh -huh. And said, that's the difference between the UN medium projection and the high projection, and the medium projection and the low projection, as you exactly, exactly. showed there. That 0 0.5 is not small. It's exactly. actually really huge, especially over time. Yeah. You know? So that's just uh, demographers versus economists in a way, right? Uh, yesterday, I was not able to see you because we were called to brief um, uh, Michelle Basile, mm -hmm. who is the former two-time head of state of Chile or former head of UN Women, and now the chairman of the Partnership for Maternal, Neonatal, and Child Health. And you know what was the briefing about? Mm. She wanted to hear 
first, the powerful arguments behind demographic dividend, mm -hmm. because he wants to get engaged in it. Mm -hmm. So the World Bank arranged for us, the Gates Institute, to meet with her, along with others, to brief her on the latest evidence and what's happening around the world and demographic dividend, which means that maybe within the World Bank, there's beginning to be a change among the economists there with regard to family planning in the context of demographic dividend framework. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, just to follow up, I, that's great news, thank you. Uh, I think many economists are persuaded that there is a demographic dividend, but they're not sure that family planning can bring that about. Yeah, so they're different things. Uh, or can help much. John. Hi, thank you. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I have a quick question. Thank you uh, for speaking. Um, so in countries like uh, the Philippines, uh, Manila, where the Catholic Church has such a strong grasp on um, any potential family planning policy, uh, do you think there are any routes for discussion with them to, to deliberate, maybe bringing in um, family planning policies in, in the city where it's, it's not just, you know, um, a rights thing, it's a wash thing, uh, family like planning can help yeah. with sanitation. Wh which countries are we mentioning? Uh, I'm sorry, the, the Philippines in particular. Philippines, I'm, Philippines yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I, here's the expert on Philippines. <laughs> I, uh, no, it's very difficult. Uh, the Catholic Church, um, I often get asked, is religion important? And uh, the answer is it depends on where you look. If you look at the average Catholic person uh, in this country or in uh, Latin America, or they have roughly the same fertility and roughly the same contraceptive use. Okay. Where the church makes a difference is at the government level. So the president likes to have uh, go for dinner with the archbishop or the cardinal, okay, and their buddies. Okay. So if the archbishop gets very upset about something, uh, the top governments say, well, maybe I'll be careful, we water it down, we do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, and then finally, at the international level, as I already mentioned, uh, the Vatican, or as it's called, the Holy See, uh, is, is everywhere in international discussions, uh, making sure that its point of view, abortion, adolescent, uh, sexual behavior, and so on, are treated the way the church wants it treated. And uh, you only need two or three countries. So um, the Vatican uh, sometimes has uh, the government of Honduras or the government of Sudan voting for it. And once you have two or three countries, even if there are 180 other countries who want to do it, it, it doesn't get done or it gets watered down or it gets put in an appendix or in a footnote. Uh, it, it just uh, doesn't. The Vatican has an important influence, uh, very important. And, and of course, we have all these groups, FP2020 and Gates, uh, who's trying to talk to the government, say, do something, it's important, here are the reasons. Thank you. Henry. John, <coughs> just to follow up on the demographic dividend, uh, yeah. you know, thinking about your past experience and so on, uh, I wonder sometimes if they're not selling too much to Africa yeah. about the demographic <laughs> dividend, because indeed the initial impact is obviously to reduce the infants and children and, and so on. Right. But this big bolus of uh, young adults yeah. is going to come. And uh, in a sense to me, you could almost say there's the youth explosion that is coming irrespective, you know, for at least 15 or 20 years, irrespective of uh, yeah. the fertility change. And the, you know, to accommodate that group and to give them, give them jobs, the jobs in the yeah, education, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of the implication is, oh, you can just follow uh, Taiwan's uh, trajectory yeah. or Korea's, yeah. South Korea's trajectory or something like that. Yeah. And I'm not sure it's, you know, that's simple. Well, uh a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, there's a lot of confusion about the demographic dividend, no question about it. And uh, African government officials often think that having a lot of young people is good because they're going to be workers in the future and that is strong for the economy. They forget that these kids don't have jobs. So um, they, and, and the discussion of the demographic dividend at, uh, often doesn't mention fertility decline or uh, family planning. There is no demographic dividend without fertility decline. That is my first message. Yeah, one second. Uh, um, the second thing is that uh, the evidence we have from the Asian tigers, uh, Taiwan, Korea, etc., is that about a third of their very rapid growth rates 
is the demographic dividend, which that's a big deal. If you ask an economist whether increasing GDP per capita by one or two percent, he says that is a wonderful thing, okay? They then uh, don't follow up with it. But the demographic dividend with a very rapid fertility decline can have an important impact on uh, economic growth. Now the Africa story is that fertility is declining so slowly and is stalling in a number of countries that the, whatever the demographic dividend is going to be much smaller than in the Asian countries. So uh, yes, we're overselling it, but there is a demographic dividend and we might as well that, that is, it's a powerful argument, and we might as well uh, explain it. Uh, especially if some, everybody gets excited about it. Um, I wanted to ask you your opinion about the relationship between women's empowerment yeah. and the effectiveness of family planning programs, yeah. particularly vis-a-vis -vis the difference between Pakistan and Bangladesh. Yeah. Because the family planning and pro program per se in Pakistan began in 1953, long before Bangladesh okay. even existed. Yeah. but. Still, they have not been able to make much headway. Mm -hmm. And if anything, the 80s and 90s showed that the two countries have really diverged in terms of women's empowerment, mm -hmm. women's economic role in the two countries, mm -hmm. and uh, women's education as well. Yeah. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that's important. Uh, I agree that that's part of the story. I measure this here with the level of education, which is a proxy um, uh, among women. Uh, but uh, yes, Pakistan has a much more socially liberal agenda. Pakistan is a patriarchal, conservative, top-down, authoritarian society. Bangladesh is much more open to ideas and experimenting and emphasizing the rights of women. Uh, very important. I was just going to add on the demographic uh, dividend and whether it we're overselling it in Africa, just to point out that the three countries that you showed that have made fairly remarkable progress in the past uh, 10 to 15 years, Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Malawi, all took family planning seriously because of the economic benefits and looking at the uh, Asian tigers as yep. an example. Exactly. So um, it's, if only other countries had recognized that uh, yeah. 10 or 15 years ago, they'd be where Absolutely. these three countries are. Absolutely. Uh, yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, you have uh, three recommendations in, in. I'm wondering what your opinion on private sector, private sector. So because I think uh, the gap in, in finance is not going to close, particularly under this government in the US, the international donation may be even declining in the next uh, several years. So do you think the government should or need to encourage out-of-pocket payment from women? I know their mm -hmm. purchase power is still low and sure. will be low in the future, but is that uh, a way to go? Thank you. Well, eventually, yes. Uh, but in the very poor societies, uh, really, women have barely enough to feed uh, their family. Uh, a pack of pills it would, would cost the equivalent of a half a year's salary. Uh, it, it's not going to happen. So uh, when countries are very poor, uh, you need subsidized services and subsidized, maybe a small, very small payment. Uh, when countries move ahead and they all graduate and, and uh, AID and other donors pull out. Um, Indonesia has uh, privatized, uh, Thailand, uh, all of these countries, when c women can afford it, they they have to help uh, pay for this. Uh, and that varies a little bit from country to country, but that's a, a broad movement in, in that direction, yeah. So it means in the short term, you still, uh, so the country still uh, have to rely on the government investment or international donation? Well, right? uh, there is uh, sufficient funds, I think, internationally available, uh, but, but you need a government to make things happen on the ground in the public sector. So for example, in Nigeria, there's no public program uh, in the country as a whole. There's some states, but there is uh, contraceptive use through the private sector. And some of that is uh, by international NGOs who, who are getting the, the contraceptives shipped in, the experts are shipped in, and uh, the women who can get access to the services are using contraception. But the government uh, itself, uh, I think uh, uh, last year they had zero dollars for family planning in the federal budget. Yeah, see, th that has to change. Uh, and if the, the, if the government in Nigeria or anywhere else 
says we're not interested in this, not much is going to happen. So you need to convince uh, the government. Uh, the funding itself uh, can in large part come from outside. Uh, well, Nigeria is a very big country, so we need a lot of money, but there is funding available. So in fact, international donors are trying to get the money down there. Uh, 